I promised an extra Q&A, so here we go. For this session, there will be zero slides. We might show you a slide or poll or two, but no slides, no additional info, just your questions and answers. We're going to work together with Petra from the chat team. We're going to keep Nico and Petra here for a while, and we're going to go through those questions that you have. So let's get going. Petra, give us some questions. <laughs> Plenty, plenty. Maybe I'll start with Petra. Uh, we have a question. Rene is asking about first level control and who will be responsible for it? Uh, is it a lead partner or how does it work in our projects with this first level control responsibility? Yes, I see this goes already in very much detail. It's very good. People are really want to get ready to apply. It's a symbol of their interest. So very like good. Yes. So um, on the control side in our program, the control will be handled on the level of um, each partner. So each partner will be responsible for addressing um, their claim to the responsible um, controller. Further information will be provided for each partner state who this control organization is. Sometimes it's handled at central level, so it's the national level who will take over this control. In other cases, the uh, partner um, um, is supposed to find a controller of his own, an external or internal controller. Um, in, so, but in all cases, it will be handled on partner level um, within each partner state according to a specific system. Um, the role of the lead partner is then just to collect the claims from the partners to put it together in the joint progress report, but the lead partner doesn't have any um, control um, function across the other partners. So right. that's supposed to keep it lean and simple and to handle the control where the most expert people are located. Um, otherwise, it would be too difficult. How could a lead partner read invoices of another partner in another country? it would be simply too complex so for sure for sure yes i like this question because it shows that our people have already thought about uh, very advanced in their preparation so they have an idea of what they want to do and now they just want to see how to do it um petra what else do we have on the list well, now I probably would go to a little simpler questions or let's say even for the newcomers and maybe beginners. Uh, can you maybe uh, clarify again, uh, Nico, which type or what type of organizations can be a lead partner in our project? Mm, yes, of course, it could even be a question for Petra because we come back to the legal, uh, the liabilities. Um, but uh, to be uh, a lead partner, you need to be uh, public, either public authorities or body, bodies governed by public law. In other words, a uh, private non-profit cannot be a lead partner. And the second element, but Petra will correct me if I'm wrong, I think also Swiss organization cannot be lead partner for the reason that Petra mentioned, because we are not also uh, channeling uh, the budget, so it's more independent from the program. But to conclude, all uh, bodies governed by public law or public authorities can be lead partners uh, in our program, apart from uh, Swiss, Switzerland. Yeah. So both EU and Norwegian Norwegian. partners. Yes, Can good specification. Yes, indeed, indeed. Um, okay, good. Petra, what else do we have? Uh, another relatively basic question, or basic, uh, there is a question, what is the average size or maybe size that we would like to see in our projects in terms of partnerships? Nico. <laughs> yes, um, this is a, another interesting and delicate question, if I may, because this is on the table for our next programming committee to be uh, taken place mid-December. So we haven't really discussed this question yet with our partner states. So there's a, there's a, you have again to be very careful with uh, what we, we're going to say. Um, usually what we would recommend is a partnership between five to eight regions. Uh, from different countries and you understand that I use the word regions uh, or 
addressing eight policy or five to eight policy instruments. What we uh, is rather new also in the future, we would also encourage that the most uh, relevant organizations in the regions, of course, if they are eligible, are also partners. Uh, I can give you an example. If you are working uh, on innovation policies, but in a very specialized field, uh, recycling fibers in the textile industry, uh, it's very important that the body in charge of this policy, recycling, circular economy, the, the, the region maybe, the regional authority is there, but it will have to come with the agency specialized for this kind of subject. It means, in other words, that uh, this region and the policy instrument address uh, will be represented by two different partners, the policy responsible authority and the specialized agency in that domain. So, in other words, five to eight uh, regions could mean up to five to 16 partners uh, or even slightly more in a single project. But again, uh, this kind of uh, recommendation will have to be discussed uh, in uh, mid-December with our partner states. So there is indeed some flexibility, but I guess starting with the project idea also sets a bit of a frame on, on what you will be doing. Um, yeah, yes. to, just to also be very clear, this is a recommendation. So uh, the, the projects are free also to go in different directions as long as they explain the reason why they go for a smaller or a bigger partnership. It's also possible. Mm. But I think the example you mentioned is very valu valuable for people to understand, especially if you're not familiar with these types of projects, how it usually works. So that gives a little bit of an idea on that. Petra, back to you. Next. Uh, I will continue with the partnership questions. Uh, some are relatively uh, simple, but still people need clarifications, I suppose, about the legal and uh, legal, um, uh, le um, legal status of their institutions. Uh, we have questions about cooperatives uh, which can make profit. Uh, how, how would you advise them to check in which category they actually fit uh, so that they know uh, which role they can play in our projects? Well, I think, first of all, on a general level, um, it would be already advisable to follow um, what Nico had suggested, going to the program manual even if it's a program manual of the 2014-2020 program, because there you already find the definition um, how um, the legal statuses are defined. So this allows um, this cooperative, for example, to already undertake a certain self-assessment in which category they would fit. And then I think in a second step, it would be interesting for them as well to get in touch with their um, national point of contact um, and um, to see with them, because they know and can better judge also um, the status within the national context and help them also to check this criteria, the self-assessment they have carried out, if it's correct or not. Yes, no additional comments from Nico on that one. So, Petra, back to you. Uh, I'm going back to uh, yet another question about partnership. Nico, you mentioned uh, about, or you talked about this justification of the size of the partnership. Sabine is asking a curious question. If a third country wants to get involved, meaning, you know, they are not in this eligible area that we defined for you, do they need to justify somehow why they need this partner, why this partner should be part of the project? I, I would say uh, yes and no. Why yes and no? Uh, because uh, if a third country partner is involved uh, in a project, he will need to answer a certain number of questions. What is the policy I would like to improve? Uh, what is uh, my situation in relation to the issue innovation environment in my region? And all this uh, answer to the question contribute to justify why uh, this partner from uh, UK or from another third country is involved in the project and contribute to the cooperation but also benefit from it. So uh, I would say it's by naturally completing the application form that uh, the assessors will understand why the third country uh, partners in, is involved. But again, uh, this is very welcome, why not? Uh, when it brings something to the cooperation, it's very welcome to uh, bring on board third country partners. The challenge, let's be honest, is that because they do not have access to the funding, they are not eligible to the funding, they need uh, to find their own uh, financing sources. And this is the reason why we have so few third country partners in the current program. Quick update.
update here before we take the next question. Um, while we answer the questions here, we can only cover so many on camera and discuss them with Petra and Nico. But if you have questions or if you want more info, keep an eye on the Q&A tab and, uh, and the chat because some of the questions are already answered there in writing. So you'll find a lot of additional useful info there, uh, some useful li links and, and other, other details. With that, um, Petra, back to you. Well, I'm just looking at one of the freshest uh, questions that we have in the chat and I suppose that would uh, go to Petra about travel and accommodation costs uh, covered by flat rate. And as we are living in this COVID times with online meetings, uh, one of our participants is asking whether online meetings will be covered by this flat rate. Whether we already know. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, the flat rate for travel and accommodation is clearly for travel and accommodation. And we really remain optimistic, although it's not very easy at the moment to be so optimistic about it. But we hope when the projects start that it will be possible to travel freely again. But of course, even if um, the pandemic is behind us um, and we will be able to meet and travel again, and study visits will be possible and so on. I think our projects also learned to do many things online. So I think this question is very relevant because also we want to reduce CO2 emissions. So we shouldn't travel for traveling and very carefully ask ourselves, when is it needed? Um, so for study visits, for example, it's certainly needed because you need to um, feel, see with all senses what's happening on the ground. But there might be some other meetings that will surely take place um, online. But this is then not covered by the travel flat rate because it's not about traveling. But um, this can then lead to some need in terms of external expertise. You might need some um, technical support or also you need some extra equipment, some licenses and so on. And this is then also covered by these other budget lines like um, equipment uh, budget line for sure. Excellent. Um, Petra, just give us a quick overview of how the chat is looking overall and uh, let's take the next question. Well, it's still very, very busy, even though I have to say some questions keep repeating because as we are trying to group them, I'm afraid some participants feel that their questions have never been asked. I'm trying to get to them. So if I can, uh, I would like to ask two more questions about partnership and then quickly move to topics and then finally uh, start discussing some of the specific activities that there were quite a number of questions about. So, uh, Nico, uh, if you could maybe clarify a little bit this uh, rule, 50% uh, of instruments represented by policy responsible authorities, uh, others um, can be eligible organizations, uh, sorry, if you can clarify this, 50% uh, for the policy instruments, what about the others? How, how does it work with the partners? How does it work with the instruments? Do they have to be the policy responsible? Are they associated policy authorities? How, how does it work? Can you maybe clarify it again? Yeah, yes, of course. And this, uh, this uh, will hopefully become an eligibility rule. So this is a very important uh, question and crucial question for the application to be successful. Um, but uh, again, ideally, in the perfect world, 100% uh, of the policy instruments mentioned in the project should be represented by the authority that is in charge of this, uh, because the, the program is for them, and the program uh, would like that this authority are the driver of the cooperation, because then you, of course, increase much more the chance that uh, policies will be improved, changes will happen in the regions. Um, so the rule is now that at least if you have, for instance, uh, six uh, policies improved in a project, at least three of them, you have to have the policy responsible authority of this instrument as partner in the project. For the remaining three policy instruments, it may be an intermediary organization that become a partner. I don't know, uh, an innovation agency, an environmental agency, sometimes uh, an education institute, uh, whatever. And this... Uh, other organization would need to involve the policy responsible authority as uh, we call it associated policy authority. Uh, so whatever happened, you need to have uh, them on board, but at least uh, in the three remaining cases, they won't be real partner because they won't have budget, so it should be easier uh, to involve them. That's how I can explain uh, this uh, 50% uh, rule. Uh, one perhaps important question and uh, that could reassure some of, of you. The, the notion of policy responsible authority is open in the program. 
uh, people think that it, it's necessarily uh, a public authority, uh, the region, the city, uh, the, the councils. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's more open than that. Uh, I, I'll give you a very concrete example. Uh, if you go, for instance, in Romania uh, in the current programming period and you want to improve uh, the structural funds, the operational program, uh, this is mainly managed at uh, central level by your ministry, but there's a delegation to manage this fund in the regional development agencies uh, of the different regions. Uh, these re regional development agencies are not public authorities in the strict sense of the term. They are bodies governed by public law. They even have a private status, in fact. But these regional development agencies, because they have an official role in managing the operational programs, these structural fund programs, they completely qualify as policy responsible authority. So it may not be as difficult for you uh, to reach uh, this 50% uh, rule. What I forgot to say during the presentation earlier this morning, in the current program, already 40% of the policy instrument addressed uh, in the project, they are already represented by the policy responsible authority. So to show you that it's really feasible, we are almost there already in the current program. All right, let's see what else we have on the list. We are making good progress with the questions. So Petra, next one. Yes, we, we try at least. Uh, now we have a few questions related to EGTC, the European Groupings of Territorial Cooperation. There are two questions about it. One of them, uh, whether they can be partners in our projects by themselves uh, or whether they can even uh, try to propose a project among each other. So different EGTCs from different areas uh, creating a project and proposing it to us. I can uh, confirm that EGTCs, of course, can also be partners in our projects. Um, they are very much welcome, um, and also as they are European per se, so of course, yes, they can be partners. On the second part? Yes, for the second part, I think uh, it makes even more sense uh, in the spirit of Interreg Europe that EGTC would come together, because EGTC are very, very uh, particular. They, they are addressing uh, territory which is not intra-regional or national, it goes beyond borders. So you address maybe uh, issues uh, that are quite specific, and an EGTC uh, working with other more traditional public authorities I'm not sure what would be the logic, but EGTC working together on, for instance, uh, integrated uh, cross-border strategies or whatever, then it would make uh, real sense. Uh, and by the way, uh, EGTC have been created by cooperation. That's the reason why they are fully eligible in our program. But we had very few uh, in the current programming period because most 98% of the projects we are supporting, they are focusing on intra-regional problems, how I can improve the, the business uh, creation in my own region, how I can uh, increase the public transport use in my city. So most of the project, most of the policy instruments we addressed are related to a specific territory which is not cross-border or transnational, let's be honest. And that's the reason why uh, there is a challenge sometimes for EGTC to be involved in inter Europe. Okay. Petra, next one. Um, at this point, I will start kind of going more to the questions related to topics. Uh, we had quite a number uh, of uh, questions related. Give us an example of uh, the new topic. For example, what would be a project in social? What would be a project in innovation? Uh, Edita is even talking about uh, some project for entrepreneurial skills. So in which topic now it would fit? Uh, I would ask Nico more a general question. What would be your advice? How could people think about their projects in terms of topics and where they would fit with our new program? Do you have some advice for them? Um, yes, it would indeed be difficult for me to give examples on each of these uh, subjects. But uh, for me, the, the core message of today, which is very good news, I think, for uh, all the audience, is that whatever uh, topic you have in mind, if you can relate it to a public intervention in your region uh, or in your city, uh, it, it will be eligible. Uh, it will be either under a more social Europe or it will be perhaps under a citizen uh, or governance. Um, so I think the good news is that in principle, if it's related to 
public policy to public intervention, it would be eligible. Then the way to investigate, I would advise um, uh, perhaps the, the applicants interested in the future program to look at the running projects. We have already 256 projects. Although they are in four priorities, they, they, they cover still a wide range of topics to give you a bit of insight in what we can do, what we cannot do. We haven't been very active on social policy, uh, despite perhaps the video you show at the beginning, uh, and on entrepreneurship. These kind of elements were not uh, really covered by the priority, but I'm sure you know in your region what are the policies uh, to help uh, unemployed, uh, long-term unemployed people to find a job uh, after five years of unemployment. What are the policies in the regions to do that, etc.? These kind of subjects become fully uh, possible, are related again to policies, uh, and I could multiply uh, hundreds of examples related to social policy, uh, the inclusion of, uh, of migrants, which is a high issue uh, currently in Europe, uh, for employment, uh, the same, how you, you do uh, long, life uh, long life learning, how you make sure that employed uh, employees continue to, uh, uh, to increase their skills. Uh, I mean, this is an infinite uh, subject. Uh, but again, as long as you can relate to a public intervention that the policy uh, resp responsible authority for this intervention is there, uh, it should be uh, eligible and it should be possible in Interreg Europe. So public intervention, policy relevance, you'll find your place among those six topics. Uh, a quick tip indeed is to, well, the whole point of this event has been to show you that there are some results and earlier uh, good ideas to build on. So do go back to yesterday's sessions, the thematic ones. They were about the old four topics, but we, we do cover some pointers towards the future as well in those sessions, especially towards the end of them. So um, do have a look at those. You get some pointers there and then indeed there are some newer aspects like the social, more social Europe and such. But Keep in mind Nico's key message and you'll find your place among our topics. Petra, let's take some more questions. Well, I, I thought I'm done with partnership, but I noticed there are two more very quick, I hope. Uh, is there a maximum number of partners per country? That's one. And the second, will we still have advisory partners in the future program? Yes, we, there's so many elements in this program. We, we really focus this morning on the core feature, so it's nice that we have this question on the advisory partner because we didn't mention it at all today. And uh, I can confirm that we will keep this notion of advisory partner. For those who don't know, it's a, a bit a special kind of partner uh, who are needed because they have a special competence either in the subject that is tackled or in communication or dissemination. Earlier this morning, we were uh, discussing about association of public authorities. This uh, kind of association could be important for disseminating the project results or spreading it uh, to other institutions. Uh, so you, you, we will have the possibility uh, to have uh, advisory partners. And sometimes it can be uh, partners like uh, universities, uh, education institutes, which are quite uh, well aware of the subject that is tackled and they advise uh, the partners in their cooperation. So that's the first question. The second question is that um, I was explaining earlier that you can have in the same country uh, a policy instrument that is tackled by several partners from the region. Why not? You could have also two regions from the same uh, country. So you could have Galicia and Andalusia, for instance, from, uh, from Spain. Uh, we would then be a bit careful about this balanced partnership, making sure that it goes beyond uh, the traditional uh, cooperation area, especially your national borders. Uh, so you have to be careful that uh, if you have several regions from the same country, uh, that uh, it's still uh, broad in terms of uh, partnership and in terms of budget allocation, the money should not go only to uh, one or two countries. Uh, but this is a kind of obvious, of course, uh, what I'm saying. All right. Thank you, Nico, for that. Um, turning back to Petra, how are things looking? Give us some more questions. Well, 
questions are still coming, but finally I'm really getting to the activities. There are plenty of questions related to action plans, their monitoring, policy instruments and clarifications, and also about pilot actions. I will start with some of the questions about policy instruments. People are asking kind of how should they find them, uh, especially the investment from jo for jobs and growth program policies. Uh, should they be in their region? Uh, where, yeah, where, how should they kind of find them? How should they identify them and consider them uh, for part of their project? And then the follow-up question is, how will it work with their monitoring or proving that actually something happened with them during the project? Um, well, for the second question, I think we would need a whole session on this because it's a, it's a very uh, detailed question and uh, quite tricky. For the first one, um, how to find the investment for growth and jobs programs, uh, the easiest is maybe to go on a uh, European Commission website, the DG Radio website, where uh, there is an area, I think, where you can find per country what are these uh, programs. Uh, I, I, know, I don't know if it's the same in all countries, but in France you have also a portal uh, for, this, for cohesion policy and there you can identify all the investment for jobs and growth program from your own country. Um, but again, for me, uh, this is not a very good sign already. You should, you should ideally come from this world uh, to come to interact Europe. You should be yourself more or less close to public intervention uh, because it should not be totally artificial. Then where you're right, we need at least one policy instrument per uh, project that is an investment for jobs and growth, so I understand your question. We have also developed uh, partner country specific information on our website, and I think we will continue in the future providing information on this program also from the program website. Currently, you can have a look, you will have, you will have all the information for the 2014-2020 period of these programs. But uh, again, uh, that's a kind of advice I could give. The second question about uh, how to uh, demonstrate that you have really achieved your objectives, that you have uh, improved uh, your policies, we will provide you uh, with further details in the future manual. But the, the approach is the same as we have now. We have categorized the policy improvement in three areas, let's say. Uh, there's a new project in the region that is uh, discovered and financed, uh, discovered thanks to the, pro to the project or the cooperation. Uh, you are doing differently your public intervention, so governance related issue. Uh, you include new indicators for its monitoring or uh, you include the new people uh, in the committee that decide on the, on the policy. This can be considered as improvement. The, the most uh, ambitious is you can also change the policy instruments completely. You can introduce a new uh, chapter on circular economy or uh, include a new measure. These are all the kind of policy uh, improvements we collect from our projects. And this is checked on a regular basis every semester through the progress report. And we are a bit demanding with this because you really need to uh, demonstrate that this has happened. We have a, a, a checklist uh, to make sure that uh, the evidence is clear enough. And hopefully, at the end of the three year of the main phase, you would have reached such improvement. And in a way, we can consider that you have achieved your objective. If it's not the case, there will be this small action plan for policy improvements to, to be produced. And what happened in the second phase is simply to monitor uh, what happened with the new projects. What happened with the new indicators? Uh, do they help? Do they make the life better in your region? Uh, what are the final, final beneficiaries of the projects? So we keep on collecting uh, the impact of the cooperation in the second phase. And for the regions that had to produce an action plan, we also check to which extent this action plan is implemented in the follow-up phase. So it's a complex uh, question. I, I try to be as clear as possible. Hopefully the, the future manual will, will provide further information on this. All right, thanks a lot, Nico, for this. Just a very quick housekeeping note at this point. We have had a very, very dense and packed morning. We started at 10 and it's now almost 12.30. We've been going through the future program, your questions, the key features, what is coming up, the timeline, the details, and uh, a lot of different aspects. We had initially planned this Q&A for half an hour, so we're coming to the end of it now. Um, 
We are going to take a few more questions, cover those. I'll let Petra pick a couple of highlights and we'll get to them in just a minute. But first, uh, for you, a quick note. We are indeed keeping all of the questions that you have submitted through the Q&A. So don't worry, your questions won't be lost. Our chat team will be answering some of those as well still after we close on stage. And we will be available in the Interreg Europe corner to take more questions as well. So we can pass the questions on to Nico and Petra and we'll pass them on to other colleagues as well to help you get answers. We'll go through them afterwards and, and collect the most frequently asked ones and provide you more information. But we will very soon start wrapping up this Q&A. So Petra, I would say let's take a couple more and get some more answers to our participants. Yeah, I, I, I feel a little frustrated because I would really like to cover all of them, but I'll try to kind of group it a little bit. As policy instruments are very, very important for our project, could you clarify, Nico, a little bit this distinction that one of them has to be at least uh, covered by the ERDF, that means from the jobs and growth programs. How is it with the others? Could they, for example, also be some cross-border uh, policy instruments that could be improved? Um, so, <clears throat> the, the, you can, uh, again, the, the advice we gave a bit earlier today uh, still stands. You can really check the definition of policy instrument in the current uh, program manual. It's almost the same. We fine-tune the word uh, a bit. But uh, policy instrument is about public intervention on a specific territory. Uh, from that point of view, you understand that this notion is very open. And uh, a cross-border program, potentially, yes, could be, uh, a policy instrument because it tried to improve the situation in a cross-border uh, area through transport, through river management, whatever. Uh, however, I, I still would like to make a, a reserve there. Uh, we, out of 258 projects financed in the period, I think we only had two or three that tried to improve uh, cross-border program, interreg A programs. Uh, it was not easy. It was extremely challenging and very difficult to influence these kind of programs. That's the first reserve I would put. The second reserve I would put is that the regulation was telling in 2014-2020, Interreg Europe can focus on investment for growth and jobs and also Interreg A, Interreg B. This is no longer the case in 2021-2027. We are focusing primarily on mainstream investment for growth and jobs. Everything related to interreg uh, cooperation, cross-border, transnational, what are the good practices, capitalize, uh, 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 build on this, is more interact. It's more our uh, sister program that is in charge of that. So I don't say that it's impossible to address a cross-border program, but it's much less uh, encouraged uh, and recommended in this period because it should be within the mission of interact. And the last thing I would say, uh, you're right, Petra, to say that policy instruments are, are the art of everything because that's the starting point of the project. You need to identify in your region what is the main strategy, uh, law, uh, or operational program you would like uh, to improve uh, before coming to Interreg Europe. And what is nice in this program is that because this definition is open, you can, you can go either to the city level, to, as I said earlier, to the regional level, to the district level. There's uh, thousands of uh, policy instruments in Europe you can pick up from uh, to come to Interreg Europe. As long as in one project you have at least uh, one region that focuses on this operational program uh, for investment for gross and jobs. Another quick announcement to our participants. I just want to go back to the Slido poll that we had earlier about your next activities. And I know that a lot of you are interested in new project ideas and seeing what else is going to happen. Uh, those sessions are starting right now. So if you are interested in project ideas, you need to head over to the expo and start networking with that, yes. Uh, so the sessions are starting, jump over there. This session has been recorded, will be recorded, you'll have access to it later, but the project idea discussions are starting right now and a new round starts every 30 minutes until four o'clock. So take your pick, find your next idea and uh, get going. Petra, we'll take two more questions and then we'll wrap up. 
That's exactly what I have prepared for Nico. Uh, one of them is connected to this new revised approach to the action plans. Uh, how does it work with the results achieved during the core phase? Need to have an action plan? No need to have an action plan? Could you repeat it a little bit for, for people because this is our new approach to action plans? And that's my first question and the second is related to pilots, but I uh, leave it for next. Okay, thanks uh, Petra. And uh, as Petra said for the finance, the, the whole idea for this new program was to go for simplification as much as we could. And um, if I can explain it in another way, uh, w you may know, for those who know the current program, we were saying to all regions involved in all projects, please produce an action plan at the end of the phase one, it was called. And we thought this was to be result-oriented, to make sure the lessons learned were not lost, but really transform into action. And we realized it has almost the opposite effect. Some, uh, not all, but some regions were saying, well, we have time, we will see with the action plan what we do, uh, let's continue working together. But, but, but that's not the idea at all. The idea at all, and a lot of projects have still demonstrated that, as uh, Erwin saw with the results, within three years, most of the regions, or a lot of regions, have already achieved something. They have already changed uh, a reference to the policy instruments. They have already financed a new project thanks to the cooperation. So we completely revise the approach saying that the action plan is required only when the region didn't manage to transform the learning into action during the three years. And as I said earlier, this is checked on a semester basis every, uh, every six months. And the most important maybe would be the last uh, report of the core phase where we will see which region exactly has demonstrated a policy improvement validated by the program. For the others, they will have to uh, complete a small uh, action plan to prepare uh, the follow-up phase. So I hope uh, it explains in another way the reason why we uh, have a different approach on action plans. Excellent. Thank you, Nico. Petra, last question. My last question relates to pilots, the pilot actions. Now we have this new approach that they can happen at the very beginning. Uh, so some questions are about what should be the basis for them? Could they be good practices from the present project? Uh, should they be uh, a more local, interregional? Could they be also for development of products even by private companies? I know I'm trying to group many different questions in this one, uh, but kind of what could be the inspiration for pilot actions? What do they mean and how to do it if you want to have a pilot action early in the project? if you can help uh, our viewers. It's indeed uh, an interesting question because in the current uh, programming period, we always say, please exchange first, see each other, understand each other, and then you may identify some ideas for pilots. So this uh, question is totally uh, justified. Uh, we, we did it before in Interreg 3C, Interreg 4C a long time ago. The idea is that in the preparation phase, either because you have been working together either even sometimes uh, in Interreg or in other EU programs, you know already that there would be an interesting practice you've seen in another region that you'd like to try in your region, and you will share it uh, with all the, 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 the partnership and the, the, co the partner during the, the Interreg your project. So this can come from a transfer that you have identified before. That's the first scenario. The second scenario we have in mind, there may be more, is that You've been quite uh, specialized in this subject that you want to treat, I don't know, a public transport in city, but none of the regions that are participating tried, uh, I don't know, to block uh, the traffic to uh, cars in a certain area of the city and uh, during certain days, I have no idea. Uh, none of them have tried this. And one, two or three regions are ready to try it, uh, to learn from it, to share it with the partnership. That could be the second uh, origin of a pilot, you will uh, together try something new uh, in the project. What is important, because there are so many things in this question, uh, we are following the definition of the commission for the pilot actions, and you need whatever uh, configuration you have, you need to demonstrate that at least two partners from two different member states 
are involved in these pilots. Even if it's very light, for instance, if you have a transfer of practice from one region to another one, the donor uh, region can simply come and help and coach the region. This will be enough to justify that it's interregional and two partner states uh, are represented in the pilots. Last thing I wanted to say, the development of a product by a private company, I don't see how this could be a pilot. Uh, we, we are about public intervention. Uh, the only example we had in the current program, there was an innovation voucher that was tried in Latvia uh, for helping companies and they selected 10 companies. You need to explain what, uh, you have to be very careful uh, with state aid, etc. And among these 10 companies, thanks to the innovation voucher that was a pilot in drag, some of them developed new products indeed. But you see, it's very indirect and it derives from a public intervention again. Thank you, Nico. Thank you, Petra. And most importantly, thank you. It's, it's amazing to have such an active audience and, uh, and see that you keep participating and keep staying with us even when we go slightly over time. This is now the end of our morning session, but don't worry. As I said, we are keeping all your questions. I'm going to direct Nico and Petra to have a look at the, those that we didn't cover here in the chat. And the rest of our team will also help them out to give you some more answers. We have the Interreg Europe corner available in the expo for your additional questions. So do head over there and uh, get those clarifications that you need. We're going to close here at the stage now for a little while, but don't go far. We'll be back at 1.30 for another session on assistance for project development. We'll take you through the steps and we'll show you what kind of support is available. So get ready for that and keep being this active throughout the rest of the day, the rest of the event. We have all the project sessions ongoing. The expo is active. Head over there, find some new partners, give a try to the networking tool and make the most of the opportunity that we're all here together because this is what Europe Let's Cooperate is all about. Thank you so much for joining and see you very soon. Thank you.